Welcome to the Sample Chapter Podcast, the show where authors read a sample chapter from one of their books. Here's your host, Jason A. Meiske. Readers and listeners all over the world, welcome to episode 97 of the Sample Chapter Podcast. This week we're sitting down with speculative fiction author Natanya Barron. We're covering a lot of topics, like the 80s and Bon Jovi. And she also gives us a terrific reading that you do not want to miss. Trust me about that. So stay tuned for that. It's coming up here in just a few minutes. Well, hey, let me uh, let me start a couple things off with a reminder and an announcement that the contest we have going on for the 100th episode, it is still going on right now, uh, so you still have time to sign up giving away several fantastic prizes we have our sponsor scrivener has given us two copies of the software one for mac and one for pc so you can win one of those we have amazon gift card itunes gift card there is the logitech multi-device bluetooth connected keyboard available for you but uh, you know best of all it's very easy to enter all you have to do is Go over to our social media on Twitter or Facebook. Find that that post. Uh, usually it's pinned at the top. Uh, but find the post that talks about the contest, what's going on, the list of prizes. Share that and you're entered. Telling me about who your favorite author was, your favorite episode. Tag that on there and tell me about your prize. Well, then you get yourself a, a bonus entry into the contest. It's really that simple. But, you know, I understand there are some people without social media. If that is you, if you are somebody who doesn't do social media, that's totally fine. Just send me an email at samplechapterpodcast at gmail.com and let me know the same information. You know, if you have a favorite author, a favorite episode, uh, what your prizes are that you're interested in, and I will put you in there. You will get the bonus entries as well. So, like I said, it's very, very easy to enter very easy to get into it, and I, I we're going to be giving away these prizes here very, very soon. It is, as of today's episode, it was coming out a little bit later in the week than what we normally would. This is uh, December 4th, so you still have some more time. Um, another, the announcement for this is that I am going to bump the 100th episode from December 10th to the 17th, thus giving everybody a little bit more time to sign up. Uh, we've already got several dozen uh, entries on, on the prizes, so go ahead and, and get yourself over there. You still have time, and get get entered. Let's get some more people in there, because it's we're having a lot of fun with it. I've got emails, and I've got lots of tags, and, and some fun banter going back and forth on the Twitter pages, and uh, it's it's a lot of fun. So what are you waiting for? Get on over there and get yourself signed up, and uh, I want to give you one of these prizes, okay? Well, look, uh, we're not going to cover a whole lot else this week. I know NaNoWriMo just ended the other day, and uh, maybe next time, uh, the next episode, I will take some time and talk about that a little bit. But right now, I don't really have that much time. I really want to get us on over to the episode. So, I want to thank our sponsors, You Store All out of Warrensburg, Missouri. They have been with us from the very beginning. If you are interested in self-storage in the Missouri area, the Warrensburg, Missouri area, Look no further than you store all. Check them out online at ustoreall.net. That is spelled the letter U S T O R A L L. They have conventional and climate control, fully fenced in facilities, more than 60 cameras recording 24 hours a day. And let me tell you, these are some very clean places. And uh, they also run off of solar power, so very green as well. Like I said, check them out online at ustoreall.net. And get yourself a storage unit today. Another one of my favorite sponsors is Scribner. They're not only a favorite sponsor of mine, but they're also my favorite writing tool. I use it for all of my writing, getting it all collected there in one place, all my research, my character information, my places, all of it's right there in handy so that I don't miss out and don't forget something. Breaking up my work in chapters so that I can search really easy to find what I'm looking for. And it, it's just such an incredible writing tool. Don't forget, they're giving away two copies of it in our giveaway, so you can sign up for that. But, you know, even if you don't win, we do have a commercial coming up here in just a moment with a special coupon code. So you can go and get yourself a copy of it for, with 20% off. So stay tuned for that. It's coming up here in just a second. 
And finally, I do want to thank my friends over at Pop Goes the Culture Podcast. Their flagship shows are taking a little bit of a hiatus through the holidays while they reset, get ready for their next season. Get yourself on over to popgoestheculture.com for lots of other fun podcasts, blogs, and uh, all kinds of things pop culture related. So check them out. We do have links in the show notes for Pop Goes the Culture as well as our sponsors, Scrivener and Ustorel. So if you're interested in any of those, make sure you click the links to find out more. Well, hey, this week, as I said, our guest is speculative fiction author Natanya Barron. Hey, we are having a lot of fun, having some good laughs, talking about uh, our love of the 80s, Bon Jovi, Young Guns, her writing and how that came to be. We talk about uh, raising an autistic child. And oh my gosh, let me tell you, when it comes to her her reading, you're going to get one of those really fun readings where she's doing the voices for the uh, for the characters, which is a lot of fun. And uh, she even has one point where she giggles at her own joke, which is a lot of fun too. That's, I love that. I just, I love it when the authors really get into the readings and have fun with it like Natanya does. So this is, this is a blast. This is a lot of fun, this episode, and you're going to really enjoy it. So stay tuned for that interview coming up right after a word from our sponsor. Jason here. Hey, I wanted to take a moment and tell you about my favorite writing tool, Scrivener. Now, I know you've heard about Scrivener because their writing software has been embraced by hundreds of thousands of other writers like you and I, from the novice to best-selling novelists. The reason we all use it is because of Scrivener's core concept to bring all the writing tools you use together in a single application. And with tools like automatic backup, character maps, project goals, and let's not forget that amazing corkboard, you can see why I use Scrivener every day. As a bonus for Sample Chapter Podcast listeners, use code CHAPTER for 20% off your desktop version. Scrivener Writing Software, built by writers for writers. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Sample Chapter Podcast. It's December. And, oh my gosh, I'm so excited to be back. There's been a little bit of a break and, uh, you know, just lots of things going on, but it's December. We're counting down these last couple of episodes leading up to our 100th, and today is no exception. We have the incredible Natanya Barron with us today. Uh, Natanya is a word tinker, has a lifelong love for the fantastic. She has a penchant for the speculative, the weird, the medieval, the Victorian, the literary, and the divine. Her work has appeared in Weird Tales, Escape Pod, Steampunk Tales, Crossed Genres, Bull Spec, and various other anthologies. Natanya, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. Oh, I'm so excited. This is this is. Uh, it's been a little while since I've had an interview, so this is. Uh, <laughs> I feel a little bit out of place and a little uh, like, oh, oh, you're going to walk me walk me through this, Natanya. Make sure we do this right. <laughs> we got this. We got this. We can do this together. We can do we this. <laughs> yes, yes, we can do this. All right. <laughs> Well, let the uh, let the audience know a little bit about yourself. Sure, absolutely. So, yeah, I, I kind of lumped what I do into speculative fiction. I think that was a term that I sort of stumbled upon about 10 years ago when I sort of was a newbie to the Internet as, as things were and sort of discovered that there were other people <laughs> writing the kinds of stories that I was writing. And at the time, um, I had just decided to opt out of a Ph.D. program. That's where my medieval background comes. So I was a medieval studies uh, master's student and um, was sort of putting my foot in the, the water for my marketing career, which is now what I do during during my day day job. And um, but, you know, the writing thing was really kind of what kept me going. What I just finished um, NaNoWriMo, which I hadn't actually won in seven years, but but about 10 years ago. Um, that really was a, a really great Kickstarter for me to just kind of start writing at a professional pace. And, um, yeah, I've always loved kind of weird, uncomfortable, funny, strange things. Um, I kind of, I think it, my, my family is, uh, <laughs> attest to the fact we take <laughs> Halloween very seriously. I wouldn't go so far to say that I'm truly a goth, but I just, I do love the haunting and strange. And most of my stories, uh, kind of come from that. I think steampunk was the place that I started in because, it kind of incorporated a lot of that sort of Lovecraftian and traditional horror, but also this cool neo-Victorian. And a lot of what I've continued to write since then has kind of fallen into that. And um, what I'll read today is, is no exception. It certainly has elements of that as well. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I've been very lucky to continue to publish for 
the last 10 years, I think 10 years ago, almost this date was when my first piece of fiction was accepted. So I guess that you know, makes me a little bit more of a, a veteran. And um, yeah, I, I love doing it. And I, I've been lucky to work with some great publishers and meet just the most incredible people. I, I live in North Carolina and we have one of the most fantastic group of speculative fiction authors in any concentrated area in the world. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's always just this wonderful community to support you and, um, and to challenge you. And that's been, you know, that's, that's what, that's the good side of the internet. That's the, the wonderful part of, I mean, I have friends that I met virtually on Twitter that I've met in person and that have been friends with me for almost a decade now. And, you know, you can't, you can't get much better than that. Oh yeah. Well, the, I mean, and that's, that's the wonderful thing, like you said about the internet and uh, you get uh, shows like this where, you can uh, hear about new people and then connect with them and, and so on. But to have a group there in uh, North Carolina that you can uh, connect with as well, that's that's fantastic. I've, I've got one here in uh, in Missouri where I am that uh, we meet twice a month, and I, I would be totally lost without them. Mm-hmm. Yep. Absolutely. It's like, it's a great, uh, sort of compliment to the <laughs> sort of hermit lifestyle that yeah. comes with being a writer because so much of your time is, is spent sort of in the corner, twiddling your thumbs, coming up with things that aren't real. But, um, it's, <laughs> it's definitely heartwarming when you find other people that, that are just as crazy as you are and the best kind of crazy. So. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. So now has, has writing been something that's always been in your background? Is it something you've always had an interest for, but uh, just kind of came to the surface at, at the, at one point? Um, I mean, I absolutely was that kid who I, I remember in second grade, we were supposed to write a story and most kids stopped at one, maybe two pages. <laughs> I remember I was like at page nine and my teacher was like, well, you know, maybe you need to learn to be a little more brief. <laughs> um, I think I'm, I'm definitely a natural born storyteller. Um, I, I love theater as a kid. I love a musician. So I like sort of the the bardic tradition, you know, we have a robust Dungeons and Dragons group here that I've been, that I've been in for a long time. And, um, you know, I think I, I sort of started out as a, as a mimic. So I did a lot of rewriting stories. I loved, especially Westerns. I did this very long sort of rewriting of the young guns movies. Um, when I, oh was, my gosh. When I was about 11 or 12 years old because I was absolutely smitten with Kiefer Sutherland and everybody in those movies. And, uh, and then I got really into Stephen King, which was kind of a, a definite pivot point. I mean, I'm, I'm an 80s kid, so I think a lot of my tastes come from the very bizarre movies and things that came out of that time period. Mm-hmm. So you've got the Nightwing story, and you've got all of the Jim Henson films, Dark Crystal and Labyrinth, and uh, the Last Unicorn cartoon, which I watched more than was probably oh, yeah. healthy for anybody. And I think that those all just kind of they kind of fed into the kind of stories that I wanted to tell. And eventually, I started writing. So I had I had my son when I was about 25, relatively young these days. And it was really having my son that made me say, you know, I've been saying I'm a writer. I've written all kinds of stuff, some short stories, you know, I did the college thing, but I haven't finished anything yet. And having him really helped me finish it. I wanted to be able to tell him I'm a writer and I've written these books instead of I'm a writer and I've written things, but nobody's seen it. So I have two kids now. I'd like to say that means that I'm twice as, uh, as, as, <laughs> as, 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 as Quite the capacity, but not definitely not. But they're they're actually older. They're seven and thirteen now. So um, I do have a lot more time than I used to, and that's been that's been really cool. So yeah, I mean, I I I, I can't really imagine um, my life without storytelling, and I, I don't know a time that I wasn't. I think I'm one of those typical people who actually uses it as <laughs> as a sort of emotional therapy. I'm not, um, I'm not super emotional in life. I don't cry a lot. I mean, I laugh, I laugh, I'm like, you know, but I, I don't, I don't necessarily feel my emotions in real time. <laughs> I think I use writing and especially, you know, big, exciting stories, uh, to kind of work through that sort of thing. I, I certainly started doing that when I was very young and I, I don't see that changing anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's certainly been a, a common theme with, uh, with the authors I've had on the show. There's always been, even somebody who's been writing all along, a lot of times there's that moment, something that's come along. And even for myself, it was, mm-hmm. uh, as anybody who's been listening to the show, for me, it was finding out that I was going to be a grandpa that finally gave me that kick in the butt. And I was just like, um, yeah, I was going to be an accomplished novelist by now. Um, yeah. so let's get going with that. And, yeah. uh, and it's funny that you would say young guns. I was just watching them this morning. <laughs> 
my gosh, they're such good movies. I love westerns, and I think people, I think people, you know, turn their nose up at them because they, they, but they're actually for the for the eighties and the early nineties. They they were really good movies, and oh, I mean, yeah. I do, I do heart me some Bon Jovi, so I do know like every song <laughs> on the Young Guns Two soundtrack, and I can play it and stick it on guitar. So if there's ever like karaoke, I will jump at any 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 ability to sing to sing those songs but um you know i, I think they, they they captured something really really good about that particular story and, and billy the kid always fascinated me and uh, the casting in those movies are just so good i i rewatched them a little while ago and i was just amazed because a lot of movies from that period just don't hold up you know you kind of go <laughs> yeah what is going on here but you know they, they did a good job of making it feel aside from the super 90s soundtrack um it was really cool. They were really, they, they were really, I mean, absolutely in terms of sort of teaching you to, I think the, the sort of, uh, not the stereotypes, but the, the archetypes rather for, for characters. Those movies are really great too, because they're such distinct personalities. Now we won't get into the fact that there's like no ladies that aren't, you know, living in the brothel, but other than that, you know, there, it's for a young writer kind of figuring out how characters interact with each other and the dialogue and all of that stuff. I think they're really cool movies. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Some of my favorites and, <clears throat> yeah, my family were also a big uh, Kiefer Sutherland fan. And <laughs> he was the he's the namesake of actually our youngest son. So who is no Kiefer? So. <laughs> wow, how weird of a coincidence is that? <laughs> yeah, that's that's hilarious. Yeah, it was because of uh, Stephen King that I started watching his the Stephen King movies, including Stand by Me, that Kiefer Sutherland was in. Yeah. Then became obsessed with Kiefer Sutherland, and that's how I got into the, the Young Guns films. So oh my gosh. you just never know, right? Yep. We all have different paths. But they're all intertwined. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And who knows? I mean, this is going to go out. We've got listeners all over the world, so who knows? Maybe somebody will, out there will know Kiefer and be like, hey, there's <laughs> these two people we're just talking about, Kiefer. So they love you, man. You got to check out the show. Check out this author. It's great, <laughs> so. Yeah, it's a great name, too. Absolutely. absolutely. There you go. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome well tell us about uh like uh, what was your first book what was uh what was that one sure so i mean my my goal i was sort of a silly goal but i think at the, at the same time it was it did help me move me in the direction but i really wanted to publish my first book by the time i was 30 um and it it, it happened life also happened i happened to have a baby at the same time and i don't mm-hmm. recommend putting your first book into the world while pregnant or nursing a child. It's all very stressful. <laughs> but um, but my first novel was uh, called um, Pilgrim of the Sky. And it's more of a sort of portal fantasy a little bit, but also I call it myth punk because it has a lot to do with sort of deities and um, sort of avatars being reborn again in, in different time periods and, and that kind of thing. So a little bit of Doctor Who in there kind of thing where these people are kind of the same archetypes over and over again and and the main character uh, maddie angler sort of discovers this world when she finds out that her her boyfriend who disappears is actually potentially one of these godlike creatures and the story sort of takes place in the modern day um i always laugh because the further further we get from the publishing of that the more the cell phone in the story seems ridiculous <laughs> it's amazing how fast technology goes but other than that most of it takes place in, a, in another universe so that that works too um but yeah i mean it was kind of a, a book that was really dear to me it put me through the ropes of you know working with a, a fantastic uh, small press publisher that just really uh, i mean i learned so much as a writer through the whole process i'd only published you know short fiction or self i had a podcast of one of my novels before then and and uh kind of you know it, that kind of publishing just puts you on the you know on on different a different level i guess i mean having reviews done in big publications and things like that so um but then i kind of had to take just for a a whole number of reasons including having a newborn um just kind of a while to kind of put a lot of the writing on the back burner and i had sort of a few dry years where i just you know and and i think that more than anything i've learned in this whole writing process is that everybody's process is totally different <laughs> and that journey is your journey is your journey and you know yeah wanting to publish by 30 is is great but did it did it really prove anything other than oh it was this finish line not necessarily so I spent a while really trying to just focus on getting my craft better on writing telling better stories writing more stories that I wanted to write working with different presses uh, I published a nonfiction book I've published a a straight fiction book uh, that's music fiction, but that first book, um, you know, that, that really, I mean, that's really kind of when, when the, the rubber meets the road, that there's so much more that happens after the book is written. Mm. And that's a really, 
a good but but difficult wake up call. But um, but still very proud of the book, and I, and I love hearing that people have read it and and that that it, it meant something to them is always cool. So. And and it's that affirmation that you can do this, and it, it kind of. Mm-hmm. Going forward, it, it makes it a little bit easier to say, like, yep, I've done this before. I can do this again. Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, I, I think that that's sort of the important thing about the craft of art and, and anything that you do. Um, you know, I think it's Amy Poehler in her book, Yes, Please, which I absolutely love. She talks about she's like, the thing is the thing, <laughs> which sounds silly. <laughs> the idea is really that, you know, and I think that many of us who create, it has to be satisfying enough in the creation of it. Everything that comes after can amplify it or make it better or make it worse but really to be able to keep going and it's okay to say I can't do this right now it's not the right time I actually um, had that recently where I was almost done with a novel and it was just it was just too much it was too deep and too dark and I was not my head was just in the wrong place for it and it wasn't bringing me any kind of joy or accomplishment and so I switched gears to another story and now I'm almost done with that one and and I'll be able to go back to the other novel and and tidy that up and have a different set of eyes to it so I think kind of giving ourselves permission to move on to something else and um, give us ourselves room to breathe because it's hard it's hard writing when you have a life (laughs) (laughs) yes (laughs) so um yeah I think I think for me anyway it really Kind of being kind to myself is an important part of, of being able to continue to write. I, I, I totally agree. Totally agree. Well, now you also, not, not only do you have your novellas and your novels, but you also do some nonfiction writing. Like you said, mm-hmm. you're, a, you're a very big uh, mental health activist, which is, mm-hmm. that's really cool. Uh, I mean, my wife is, is very big with uh, suicide prevention and awareness. Mm. Uh, she, she's well-trained in that and, uh, and was, was a, big time advocate while we were in the service. So uh, can you speak on uh, some of that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So um, as I was saying, the the sort of hiatus between my first book and things that came after really a big, huge part of that was that not only did I have a newborn daughter, uh, but also my son was diagnosed with autism. And um, that really does change everything (laughs) in terms. I mean, I, I really, I don't think of it in terms of like this, you know, this, this terrible sentence for the rest of his life and oh, oh, sad, sad me, but it is a totally different way of parenting. It requires you to have a completely, you know, you, you really have to take it down to the foundations and, and relearn a lot of things, not just about parenting, but about interacting with other human beings. Um, you know, our son is, is very verbal. He's actually, I joke that he's the opposite of nonverbal which means he doesn't really have an internal monologue. He says everything he thinks, which can be its own brand of, of interesting. But, you know, the, what his emotional uh, dysregulation and um, depression, and uh, he certainly had uh, threats of self-harm and all of that stuff and hospitalizations and trying to navigate that in, in the system that we have is absolutely terrible. North Carolina is one of the states that just does not have much for families in, in terms of that. You're really, it's kind of, you're stuck in this lottery. And I, I joke that it's the worst lottery in the world, that if you're in a crisis situation, you have to wait to see if there's any of the facilities across the state that are willing to help you out. And, um, you know, we've done a ton of work with him. He's been in dozens of programs. He's doing really well now, but it really is absolutely a full-time job and then some. Um, he's 13. He's actually back in public school and doing fantastic, which is totally a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, watching you know, he's and he's a genius. I, and I don't say that because he's my kid. I mean, that he can take apart and fix iPhones. And he's been doing it since he was like nine. Um, he oh, can wow. name every make and model of cars from here to Japan. You know, he wants to he wants to buy a car that uh, the Japanese makes so that they're, they're the right hand drives. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, he, he is, he is incredibly, incredibly intelligent, um, from an IQ perspective and from a learning capacity perspective, but he really struggles with that emotional component and the social component and sort of the appropriate response when you're upset or, um, you know, just being able to navigate with, and I, he's 13. I told him, you know, I tell him all the time, like nobody wants to be 13 again. <laughs> 13 is just, 13 is just wretched, but, um, but you know, he's really, 
grown incredibly. And, 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 you know, I know it's because we have a great community here, but also because we have worked and pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed. I've been on national television shows. I've been in newspapers. People know who I am when I get there at the, at the hospital, if we have a hospitalization. And unfortunately that's just the level that you have to be at. And, um, the sad truth is that most people do not have the support that Liam does, does not have the kinds of families that the divorce rate alone for parents that have children like him is, is upwards of 75%. It is so hard to maintain any sense of, of normalcy when you're just always wondering, like, is he going to grab a knife or is he going to try to jump out the window or um, what's he going to be upset about today? But um, through great medication and fantastic doctors and by the sweat of all of our brows, you know, he's, he's doing better, but um, it's an epidemic in terms of, the lack of mental health supports for kids, which I, I know I probably don't have to tell you uh, mm. given what your, your wife is working in. But, um, you know, it really is a tragedy that we, we wait. The system basically is, is set up to the point where, you know, it's only responsive. It's only responsive. So if you are in serious, 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 serious dire straits, basically we were able to get more help rel relatively recently because we had gone to the hospital so many times. And it's like, that shouldn't be the solution. It should be preventative. Yeah. And there should be ways that we can, you know, <laughs> we've been trying to tell them forever that, you know, he needs more support. But, um, but yeah, overall he's doing very well, but, but kind of seeing what he's had to go through and what other kids have had to do in this, in the same situation, it's just, uh, something I'm clearly very passionate about and, um, you know, doing the best that we can. It's all about the little moments. <laughs> it's all about the little moments. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and that's great that you, you get to, you, you get to write about that a little bit and uh, just getting some attention and, uh, you know, and, and, and it never hurts that when somebody's looking at that and then they might look and see, well, what else has she done? Oh, look at these novels and novellas and, and something completely different and outside. Cause as I was reading here, I mean, you're a, a Slytherin. You like the Tyr <laughs> Tyrells and <laughs> yeah, I, I am a certified nerd in every, in every possibility. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> But I mean, I think, I think stories are really powerful that way. And, and it's interesting. My son is not a huge reader, but when he finds a book series he likes, he reads every single book and he doesn't want to do anything else. And then like, it takes a year and then he'll find another series and he'll just read, read everything. He just finished, finished the whole uh, insurgent series. And he just, he was like, mom, this is so incredible. And you know, it's, but it's hard for him. Fiction is very hard for him. So that can be an interesting challenge just as being his mom, considering that's sort of my thing. <laughs> <laughs> so now is this something that, uh, I mean, it sounds like the stories that you like to write are very much like what you like to read where you just kind of like to give me something wild, give me something, mm -hmm. a situation. Um, it, does any of this, uh, any of your life inform any of this or do you find a, a, any kind of a crossover? A little bit. I mean, I've actually, um, in the, in the book that I am, I'm writing right now, I actually have, uh, an autistic character and, uh, she's a, she's a woman. And so it's a little bit different in the way it presents, but that's been kind of a really neat thing to dive into. I, I suffer from depression and anxiety and all kinds of fun stuff. And I've certainly infused those things into my characters. Um, absolutely. But yeah, I think, you know, I think one of the things that I've really been exploring recently is sort of the absurdity of existence <laughs> and the absurdity of even even the genres that we write in, my my most recent thing is is almost borderline satire, but it's like actually really fun because I can comment on the ridiculousness of it. But it's actually kind of I mean, even if you read the Bible, you know, there there's plenty of absolutely ridiculous things. I remember reading the book of Revelation when I was a kid and just going, Who was on drugs when they wrote this? Because there's a lot of really confusing imagery going on right now. Um and then, you know, as a as a medievalist, so much of the medieval mind was absolute absurdity. If you look at some of the illuminated manuscripts that are out there and you think about these monks that were, you know, inside these monasteries for their whole lives and they're drawing the most ridiculous, often incredibly dirty marginalia to keep their time or they're completely drunk or cats are wa walking across their work. And I think, I don't know, for, for me, getting through the last few years has been a lot about making sure that I don't take things too seriously, which means that you can kind of be a little more broad with your, with your storytelling strokes and, and, and take time to be witty and to have the banter and kind of entertain yourself as, as you're doing things. So. Oh yeah. 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 And, and I, I can totally see that. I mean, it's, it's a lot of times, 
uh, there's not so much we have to make up as to just look in the history, like like you were saying, mm -hmm. so many different things. I mean, you just look at uh, the Greek gods, for instance. It's like, oh my gosh, how crazy can yeah. it get? <laughs> yeah. Yes, and they they, they feature actually uh, quite prominently in this series. There's a couple of them, uh, both Hades, Hermes, Apollo, and Artemis are all in at one point or another in this particular series that I'm going to read from today because many of the monsters that are in the stories are actually just products of, you know, uh, errant gods kind of on their trysts and love affairs. Um, and a lot of the book actually asks the question, what is the difference between a monster and a god? And I don't think there really is that much of a difference when you kind of dig down deeper. So um, I've always loved the outcasts, but I think uh, a, a lot of the story is between figuring out how much, how similar sometimes you really are from what is the good guy and who's the bad guy and all of that stuff. Oh, okay. Well, that's yeah. a great, that's a great segue right into that. So <laughs> your, your book today that we're hearing from is uh, Masks and Malevolence and mm -hmm. it's book two of the series. So what's, uh, what was the first one? Sure. The, the first one was called Frost and Filigree. So, um, and it's the Frost and Filigree uh, series, the, the final, the, when the books are all together, it's called These Wicked Beasts. So that'll be the, the title of the full three novella novel. Um, but yeah, Frost and Filigree, Masks and Malevolence, and Time and Temper are the three sort of books that make that up. Okay. All right. And can you give us kind of a, an idea of what we're, uh, what we're expecting with this series? Sure, absolutely. So the, the, the two main characters are uh, Nerissa Valdemar, who is the Lamia, so she's like a snake lady, hmm. and she'll she'll be the first person you meet in a moment, um, and uh, Vivian Dulac, who's sort of a, a night sylph, so sort of a, a dark, almost vampiric kind of creature, and uh, Nerissa's hopefully, hopelessly in love with, uh, with Vivian, who couldn't care less, um, but she uh, sort of... Throughout the story, they're they're living in Terrytown, New York, and there's these mysterious murders happening in these uh, sort of this cultish group of people who are completely ridiculous, but actually end up they're on the right track somehow. And it turns out that they meet a couple other people, uh, including uh, Christabel Crane, who uh, is actually a unicorn, which you'll find this also. It's a little bit of a spoiler, but it's it's it's, uh, it's an important detail to know in this particular context. And then a questing beast named Worth Goodwin. And the four of them sort of are the main points of view in the story. And there's a bit of a love triangle and a square and a polygon. I mean, they're just kind of all <laughs> over the place. But um, uh, and then also kind of their dealings with the Greek pantheon, as well as the djinn and, and a couple of other things. So they, they solve this mystery in the first book in Terrytown, New York, among sort of these big, huge mansions, if you're familiar with the area where Sleepy Hollow happened. So Christabel Crane is a is a descendant of Ichabod Crane. Yeah. And um so the, kind of this very decadent, almost Downton Abbey style background where there's plenty of bloodshed and monsters everywhere. And uh, at the end, Vivian gets abducted and is taken away by this genie that they had to free in order to beat this monster. And they've been looking for 10 years when this particular story starts uh, in the second book. And they haven't found her, but they've followed the trail all the way to Cairo. So the second book uh, is called Beasts of Cairo because it takes place in that famed Egyptian city <laughs> in the 19 <laughs> in the 1920s which I thought was just one of the most fun I, I love the mummy movies speaking of movies that I love so I kind of wanted a, a little bit of that feeling in, in this particular book okay fantastic well where can uh, where can people find and follow you so I am at Natanya Barron almost everywhere out there, including Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. Um, and then I have my website, natanyabarron.com. You can find links to my books as well as uh, my publishers, Candle Mark and Gleam and Falstaff Books. And uh, yeah, if you Google Natanya, actually, I think I'm, I'm pretty close to the top because there's not many others. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the gist of where you can find me. Fantastic. All right. Well, and we'll make sure to have links to all this in the show notes so that everybody can, you can just click the links and then you get right in there. I just pulled up Masks of Malevolence myself and it's even on Kindle Unlimited. So it everybody, is. you got no reason not to check this out if you have yes. Kindle Unlimited like I do. So I'm adding, I'm building my, <laughs> my reading list as we speak, it looks like. So, all right. Well, cool. <laughs> Natanya, thank you so much for being a guest. I've had a lot of fun listening to you and I can't wait to hear this. This sounds incredible cool well i'm excited to share thanks all right well ladies and gentlemen natanya baron with masks and malevolence all right chapter one sand snake 
One of the most challenging issues facing Alamia is the weather. It is for this reason that Nerissa Valdemar has chosen for the bulk of her life to live in moist climates with consistent humidity and mild summers. Her folk are, after all, made up of one of about 90% scales, and once the little armored bits lose their lubrication, the result is both itchy and pathetic in terms of appearance. Since they do not molt like more conventional lizards, Lamias must keep their scales as hydrated as possible. She is very attractive for a Lamia, but between her slimy lips, fangs, scales, and yellow eyes, her general appearance is less than acceptable to most human beings. It is made only worse without sufficient humidity and a poor diet. But in the arid climes of Egypt, maintaining moisture is no simple task. Inside the ramshackle automobile jolting through the streets of Cairo, Nerissa pulls at her collar again, where the clothing chafes against her skin. Though the glamour she wears is impressive, too much motion and irritation will make her scales visible, so it requires her utmost concentration. At the moment, Nerissa appears as a rather plain woman, dull brown hair tucked into a wide-brimmed hat, scarf about her neck, and glasses perched on her narrow nose. It is her favorite vestment, and it is usually easy to sustain in this particular situation. She's chosen a riding dress and long linen coat. It is not quite the fashion of this new decade, which veers towards short hair, short dresses, and fringe, but it is sufficient in this weather. Nerissa, you must stop fretting, says the man across from her. He is dressed as an explorer, an adventuring hat on his head, a white linen shirt beneath a khaki jacket, and an array of pockets, most of which are there purely for show. You'll draw attention. I'm not the one who looks like he walked out of the pages of a penny dreadful, hisses the Lamia. You're a walking sartorial cliché, Worth. The goggles are particularly offensive. Worth Goodwin should be forgiven his eccentricities, considering his existence as a gladisant or questing beast, and like Nerissa, potentially one of the last of his kind. But his personal lack of style is legend. They both know he's a lost cause, and if their mutual friend and mutual object of affection, Vivian Dulac, were around, she would mince words. But the sad fact is that Lady Dulac is quite put out, imprisoned, in fact, at the hands of a very powerful genie named Barkan. Technically, Barkan was Nerissa's, but she had let Vivian live under the perception that the genie was hers to command. So Vivian had gone about as Barkan's mistress for almost a hundred years, while Nerissa orchestrated from the sidelines. When the Lamia at last loosed the creature from his bonds, it was only to save Vivian's life, and indeed half of Terrytown, New York. But in recompense, the gin took Vivian, and the Rockefellers never forgave them for the mess. It is for this precise reason that Nerissa and Worth are bothering to work with one another once again. Half a century ago, they functioned as Valdemar and Goodwin, dedicated to finding and expunging fey creatures gone mad, known as aberrants and exigents. Their partnership did not end well, but due to the events of Terrytown, not only did they reinstate their business, but added another partner, Christabel Crane. I like the goggles, Worth says, steadying them at the band of his hat. They are useless, Nerissa knows, since his eyesight is uncannily perfect, but he insisted they make him look professional. Christabel said they gave me a dignified air. She's a unicorn. She wouldn't know dignified if it popped out of a pie at brunch. And there is that as well. Christabel is beautiful, intelligent, and a unicorn. Nerissa hates her as both a matter of principle and a deep-rooted disgust for anything with hooves that she can't eat. That isn't very nice, Worth admonishes. I don't have to be nice to her. The very fabric of my being is antithetical to hers. Besides, she's always so energetic. Her energy and knowledge are essential components in our success as Valdemar, Goodwin, and Crane. She is helping us tremendously. Is she? I had hoped we'd seen more from her. Nerissa does not like admitting that the unicorn is any help. But she is essential. She is much better at blending in with humans, and since she grew up among them, not knowing her own provenance until the Terrytown incident, she even likes them. You mean the incident with the poisonous goats? Worth asks in that infuriatingly sarcastic way of his. An easy mistake. They looked perfectly edible to me. Nerissa is not about to give the crane woman any acknowledgement. She adds, from a distance. Yes, their chartreuse eyes and crimson spiked horns were practically invisible. What of the stone-toothed tiger? Her quick thinking got us out of that. Nerissa snorts. I could have been able to share the same incantation if my teeth weren't petrified at the time. They might still be if she hadn't intervened. 
Nerissa groans, peering out the window into the dusty world beyond. All she sees are camels, bright-colored caftans, and the glare of the noonday sun. Her stomach heaves with the fumes from the engine. I wish she would stop trying to convince me to like her. She's taken very well to instruction in martial arts, he says. You've got to admit that, at least, and she's a crack shot. Nerissa sighs like a scolded child. Her scales are starting to ache again. All this talk of goats has made me hungry. How far are we from the abattoir? Not far, Worth says. We're slowing already. The car soon comes to a complete stop. The local abattoir, one of many such establishments in the Red Camellia Network, which deals specifically to the more eccentric tastes of the Fae, is a rather banal name for such a nefarious place. As is the case with most Lamias, Nerissa must dine on blood to survive. And while settled in at home, she usually makes do with animal blood. However, grudgingly, it is rather impossible to travel with a herd of goats halfway across the globe. She's relied on these places to get her animal blood, but she cannot find it herself. Well, at least the abattoir in Cairo is easy to find. For their trip across the sea, they'd had to travel with two sheep, and Nerissa down in the manger with them. If seafaring wasn't bad enough as it was, only two sheep to feed off meant rationing. By the time they arrived in London, she couldn't tell if she was sick from the constant bobbing of the ship or the lack of food. Since then, she's been fasting for long periods of time, eating only when she can get supplies from the abattoir networks by delivery. But in Cairo, it's not a good long-term plan. She knows she's got to make long-term contract. When was the last time you visited an abattoir? Asks Worth as they disembark the car. It is hotter and drier somehow than she dreaded. While there is wind, all of it seems to do is swirl around and fan the flames of heat. Nerissa feels as if she's roasting from the inside, half expecting to see smoke rising from her glamour. London, I think, Nerissa says, trying to recall. A short trip, but necessary. Well, we had that long, week-long stalemate with a ghoul in the tower who was in love with a gargoyle sconce. She looks up at the building, Arabic letters glittering with new paint, and lifts an eyebrow. It certainly wasn't this impressive, though. More like an apothecary shop. The blood was not fresh, but I can't be picky these days, unless I start stealing livestock or eating people again. Vivian would never forgive her that. Ten years ago, she might have considered it, but now... Without Vivian in her life, she feels a stubborn need to follow the life the Sylph worked so hard to give her. A life of helping humans, not eating them. Help, don't eat, Nerissa mutters. Curious, Worth says, double-checking the address in his ledger. He snaps it shut in one motion, a soft clap following suit. I was expecting a seedier part of town, weren't you? That is the trouble with the building. It is very nice. Flanked by places of business booming with commerce, a tailor overflowing with imported silks, a bank, a haberdashery, and a garish jewelry store specializing in unusually placed Egyptian trinkets for the more daring set. Such decorations are, if the signs are to be believed, rather the rage these days. An abattoir should not present such a bold facade to the outside world. In London, Paris, France, or Milan, such a visible storefront would never pass muster, not with their stock. While Cairo has always had its eccentricities, catering to the weird and wild magics quite beyond Nerissa's own understanding, it is still nonetheless a far cry from the subtlety she's used to. In the decades since Vivian's capture, she and Worth have seen all manner of cities, and when goat is not available, finding an abattoir has never been easy, always an alleyway or a sewer grate or a hidden doorway. Here, though, the words upon the sign describe bloodletting and prostitution in detail, there is even a bronzed young man standing by the door, gold chains around his sunken chest, looking expectantly toward their car. I don't like the look of this, Nerissa says, as Worth begs to leave. She puts a warning hand on his knee. This is the sort of place I've only dreamed of, our world made visible. And because you like to ruin every dream of every creature, somehow you distrust it. I simply mean that it's very out in the open. Perhaps the Egyptians have a different view? Oh, they have different views on everything, to be sure, but I'm nonetheless doubtful that they would be prepared to put an abattoir on display for all to see. Shall I check ahead, then? Worth asks. Ask a few questions. Do a bit of undercover work? They can already see us, Nerissa points out, gesturing to the wind-blown opening in the carriage and the waving figure of a young man beckoning them enthusiastically. In that case, I suppose we should develop a backup plan. Which is, Nerissa asks. Worth grins, flashing his teeth. Run like demons run our wake if things go sideways. That's your backup plan for everything. But it's so effective. It worked in Kiev. Nerissa hesitates, looking back at Worth. She feels vulnerable, and she hates that. Worth, do we have to do this? 
It's either this or visit the vampires, Worth says with a shudder. She nods. Anything is better than dealing with vampires. Not wanting to think about Kiev, Nerissa rolls her eyes and gathers her rather impressively tailored skirts, meant to give her a significantly better range of motion, and, belly grumbling, slowly makes her way to the front door of the abattoir. Worth falls into step behind her, and she tries her best to give the boy a warm smile. This is complicated by the fact that she is a lamia and more than half snake. Even her best smiles are no more than sophisticated glamours, and as such, the fellow deflates a little as she approaches. Good morning, she says to him in smooth Arabic. Hello and welcome to the Thousand Suns, he replies, bowing low and moving his gaze to Worth, eyes full of curiosity. And you as well, sir. We are curious as to your establishment's offerings, Nerissa says, trying not to take offense to the fact that the young man is far more interested in Worth's business than her own. She should be used to such behavior, and yet it still stings. Would that she could avoid all the trappings of proper society and still find Vivian, or that she could simply cut herself off. People are drawn to Worth no matter what ridiculous outfit he wears. We don't speak of business in the sun, the young man says, narrowing his eyes at Nerissa as if she has just committed the greatest of sins. She snorts. We aren't aware of such habits, she says smoothly. We are a very long way from home and looking for a bit of rest and refreshment. Worth shifts uncomfortably. For her, he says, not, uh, not for me, not right now. The young man tilts his head and looks appraisingly at Nerissa. You're older than you look, he says, as if just coming into this knowledge. Then he shrugs. But no matter. Follow me. Cook is always happy to entertain guests from far-off lands. We simply must introduce you properly first, and then make a match. The inside of the Thousand Suns does not disappoint. The walls boast thick carpets and silks woven in shades of purple, crimson, and gold, and the furniture is clean, well-made, and the scent of wax and sandalwood waft toward them. But there is an undercurrent odor, too, a pulsing, musky smell that Nerissa notices immediately despite the liberal application of incense. It's blood, fresh blood, willing blood. It's enough to make her dizzy from it. But there are no food stores in the room directly. It is a waiting room, and no more. Three heavy doors, pointed and inlaid with filigree and cloisonne, lead elsewhere, but are, for the moment, impermeable to Nerissa's own powers of sight. She is tired. She feels Worth's hand on her shoulder, and she casts him a withering look, but the old bastard is looking at her with such pity, with such understanding, that she can't quite summon the visual daggers. We've got to figure out something more permanent, he says gently. You know as well as I do that we can't find Vivian if we're weak. Perhaps they have access to camel blood. You haven't tried that yet. Nerissa frowns, well aware of her limited capacities. She's grown less reliable over the years, her brain fuzzy, her reflexes slow. This loss of abilities only fuels her irascible nature, which is already likely to sour milk. And while playing the simpering lady adhering to culture and societal niceties has never been high on her to-do list, she's quite aware that failing to do so could land them into some trouble. The young boy excuses himself and goes through the middle door, a blue and green affair that reminds Nerissa of some of Vivian's favorite kinds of pottery. Why must everything come back to Vivian? It shouldn't still hurt this much. Worth and Nerissa do not sit, but rather remain a comfortable distance from one another, each observing the parlor. In the ten years that they've been on Vivian's trail, Worth has learned to avoid filling every sentence with words. He offers what he can and leaves Nerissa to her stewing, which is a much-needed reprieve after almost a century of open hostility. She would almost admit to liking him if it wouldn't compromise her reputation so much. Shortly, a man appears in the doorway of the third room, the red and orange one, and emerges rearranging a caftan over a set of jacquard pantaloons. He is red in the face as if from copulating or exertion or both, and wipes a hand over his almost bald head before offering a graveyard smile. Nerissa tries not to stare at the fellow, but there is something sticking out of his head at a rather curious angle. It is unlike any protrusion she has seen before. From where she's standing, it looks as if there's a pipe shoved into the center of his forehead, cracked and hollow and rather unsettling. She's immediately bothered and can't stop thinking about the grating noise it would make should wind move across it. In fact, when the odd man starts coming toward them, she wants to beg him to slow down just to prevent any kind of misfiring. Are you the cook? Worth asks, and Nerissa is glad that one of them is paying attention enough to attend to the task at hand. She must be hungrier than she thought. It's what they call me, the fellow says, wiping a hand down his slick cheeks and trying again with a smile. He smells of stale wine and rancidity besides. Cook is fine enough. 
We don't mean to impose, Worth says, but is immediately interrupted. Of course you mean to impose. That's what the Thousand Suns is for. Imposition. We survive on it. If people don't impose on us, we wouldn't be in business, Cook says with a light shrug. He coughs and then sucks a good deal of phlegm back into his sinuses and then swallows. Nerissa orders her face still, lest she display a grimace of such disapproval they would be ushered away. I was just doing my morning sparring. Is that what we're calling it now? Nerissa asks, almost too quiet to hear. Cook doesn't rise to her bait, but continues to address Worth. Al says that you're not from here and looking for some refreshment for the Gorgon, I imagine. I am not a Gorgon, Nerissa says, willing her voice even. I am a Lamia. A snake is a snake is a snake is a snake, Cook says, raising an unconcerned eyebrow. So my dear mother always said. And what was your mother? Nerissa narrows her eyes, wears her gait. She was hoping to avoid bloodshed so early in the day. An expert on the serpentine? A peri, actually, Cook says. Some half-demon, half-angel. He looks askance at Worth, and his grin widens. A rather curious creature like our fellow here, and yes, she had a passing interest in Gorgons. I'd never seen one until you. Worth clears his throat. This is Nerissa Valdemar, my business partner. She's a decent lamia. When Worth makes no retort, she says coldly to Cook, and that is Worth Goodwin, an indecent glatisant. A glatisant? Cook asks, and here I thought them extinct. Clearly not, Nerissa says. But we were talking about you, sir, weren't we? Cook makes a sad smile at the two of them and then says, I'm not what I was, it's true. And I suppose I don't blame you for suspicion. My business isn't pure one, but my life has not been pure either. Let's just say someone found out what I was and took it into their own hands to remind me that it had a considerable say in how I was to live the rest of my days. He points to the protrusion on his head. I used to be able to make music with this. For once in her life, Nerissa truly wishes Christabel was with her. There's something she should remember about creatures like him. A name, a warning. She racks her brain for it, but all she can think of is that dissonant music going through his horn, and she feels nauseated again. She could taste him and find out. Worth gives her a warning look, eyes bulging, and he continues. So... Now you're the fine proprietor of the Thousand Sons, Worth attempts to keep the conversation away from such melancholic themes. It could be worse. I sell creatures to settle debts to bigger fish than me, Cook says, as if the business would bring him to sainthood. They bleed, they rot, they kill to grasp what shards of their souls still exist. But I suppose you're right. Most of them live, though the jury's out as to whether or not that's the good side of things. Nerissa can't find any words that will make sense in the situation, and for once cannot summon an ounce of sarcasm or vitriol. So she does what she'd learned to do in the last decade. She stares fiercely at Worth and hopes that he does something significantly more tactful than she can manage. Worth's nostrils flare, a sure sign that she's angered him, and he says, Now that you've thoroughly made us feel loathsome, I still must ask you for business. My traveling companion here... You've got good Persian, says Cook, but I know you're not used to such brazen visibility among the mortals. He smiles a little sadly, then shrugs. I honestly don't know what you are or why I'm so keen on telling you. He looks a bit embarrassed, flushing a shade of puce. I'm of no particular interest, I assure you, Worth says. Simply a lone beast in a world of monsters. You remind me of someone, Cook says half to himself. I'll figure it out, but in a moment. In the meantime, my friends, I believe I have just the loner for you, if that's what you're looking for. She's been begging for a bit of adventure, and I can tell by the looks of you two that sitting still is not what you're thinking of doing. Before either of them can argue to the contrary, Cook is back through one of the doors again, and Nerissa and Worth are left staring at one another. There wafts a distinct scent of pistachios, and Worth's stomach gurgles audibly. For once, Nerissa isn't the only one famished. We're always looking after your food, he says self-consciously. You're the one with four tongues and you're a vegetarian, she says with spite she can manage. I only have to feed once every few days. I hear the dates in the market are quite delicious, he says longingly. What did he mean by loner, Nerissa asks. I just want access to a blood supply. There is no time to answer. The yellow door opens again, revealing Cook flanked by a young woman. She has what can only be described as luminous eyes, cat-like and clever. They are nighttime pools of twilight. She has jet black hair, straight as silk, and wearing a kimono of sorts, though cut from fabric of Egypt. 
Vivian, if she were around and not imprisoned by a mad genie, would be able to sight the exact pattern, but Marissa cannot summon it. The young woman's skin is lightly freckled, especially about the eyes. Still, she is very small, even for a monster. Perhaps she knows the way to the blood supply? This is Kit, Cook says, waving a dramatic hand her way. She comes to us from quite far, having run afoul of Hecate a few years ago. A bit of a mischief maker, but should do the trick. Nerissa understands the situation slowly, the pieces falling together. She is not a mortal. Of course she isn't mortal, Cook says with a laugh. What kind of place do you think this is? We don't deal in mortal bodies. I just need food, Nerissa says, trying hard to keep the growl from her voice, while ignoring the look of sheer amusement in Kit's eyes. I don't want a, a person. I can get you food, the young woman says, or serve as your meal. It doesn't bother me either way. It should, Worth intones, clearly discomfited by the whole business. It bothers me, Nerissa says, which is not entirely true. I wanted access to a blood network. The vampires deal in blood, and they've got quite the stranglehold. I deal in a bit of a loophole, Cook says. He ponders for a second, then says, You said you wanted food, not fun, unless I'm mistaken. Food, Worth and Nerissa say at once. Good, well, I won't lie to you. She's trouble in her own way. But she won't run away, and bleeding doesn't bother her, says Cook, as if this was a selling point. But she should be able to run food errands for you whenever you need, tireless little thing. Worth blinks eight times in succession, perhaps twice for each pair of eyes beneath his glamour, and he shudders. I honestly don't know what to make of this. They come from a far away, our guests, Cook says to Kit. They have to live in secret, hiding in dark corridors, fighting one another just to keep alive. I know they've come a very long way, and they've run out of warm bodies. They do not mean to be insulting. That is not our aim, Worth tries. Kit grins, leaning forward on the balls of her feet. I'm a very skilled person, she says, in ways you can't imagine. Skilled enough that you landed yourself here, Worth says. Kit tilts her head one way, then another, as if trying to size Worth up. For someone with so many brains, you are a very concrete thinker. I like her, Nerissa says. And then here's a dissonant chorus of music lift around her, and she decides that having a person like this isn't such a bad idea, after all. And that was Natanya Barron reading a sample chapter from her novella, Masks and Malevolence. It's the second book in her series. The third book is coming out real soon, so make sure you get on over. Click the link in the show notes so you can find and follow Natanya and uh, be aware of when that one uh, is available. Hey, don't forget to also click the links in the show notes for our friends and sponsors alike. Get over to our social media or email us for the contest going on. We've got some more time for that, and I want to give you a prize. And also, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out next time when we come back with a new author, a new book, and a new sample chapter. Take care, everybody. We'll see you again real, real soon.